Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today's guest is Joanne Page, President and CEO of the Fortune Society of New York, which builds people, not prisons. Thank you for joining us, Joanne, and a reminder to our webinar guests that you can ask questions to the Q&A and chat functions at the bottom of your screen, and we'll try to cover those topics during the show or afterwards. Joanne, thank you so much again for, for coming and talking about the Fortune Society. Talk a little bit about your, your work and the scope of activities that you provide uh, as, you, uh, as you help people exit the, the incarceration system, the prison system, and into society. Well, first, it's a pleasure to be with you. And uh, I've been at Fortune 31 years as the CEO. And we've grown the organization from a very small organization to a considerably larger one with the same values uh, from the time that we were founded in 1967. We do two things. We advocate on criminal justice issues and we serve people who have been impacted by incarceration and help them build good lives in the community. Uh, we started as a self-help organization right. and that's in our bones. More than half of our staff are formerly incarcerated, or many have substance abuse histories, many have experienced homelessness. But there is a level of provision of hope that you have when the person you were locked up next to is out there and doing well and role models that it can really work. So that's a core part, it's in our bones. Uh, what we do is we do wraparound services. We serve perhaps 8,000 people a year. Uh, we have no exclusions except that if people pose a current risk of violence, they need to leave and come back when they're ready. Right. But we have no exclusions based on charge, based on record. We have no clean time requirements. Uh, we believe that if people are asking us for help, we need to be there for them. So our services are wraparound services. Uh, everybody is entitled to a hot meal, to somebody to talk to, to help in figuring out what their next steps are and getting linked to services. And as we've evolved over the years, we've built that array of services until we really do one-stop shopping. The, the, the thing that I find so interesting about the self-help model and the idea of responsibility is that the people who have experienced, they know. They know how they themselves entered the system they know what the precursors were to that entry. They know what it is like to be imprisoned, to live in that small space, in that close proximity. They know the excuses that they made for themselves, and they know the transformation that they needed to go uh, to undertake in order to be at the point that they're at today. They know. They also know the neighborhoods that most of the people who are incarcerated comes from because they grew up in those neighborhoods, which means they know the risks and they know the strengths of those communities. And they serve a powerful role because they often still live in those communities and, and do their a, role modeling. It's a competence that comes from lived experience, right? There is a graduation that you go through and then eventually you get to the point where you can actually help others. And that also goes for the families as well. I, I think that the, the real question here is how do we look at the process of justice and imprisonment? Do we, do we look at, injust, uh, at justice as a uh, question of catch and punish? Or do we look at the question of justice as a, in a more holistic way, which ends up with citizens actually being able to function and, uh, and helping to make the society, society help, uh, more healthy? Um, I think the one, the one path leads to recidivism, leads to marginalization, leads to ignoring a, a, a real uh, clear problem that we have. And another path is, is a much more healing path, but it's more complicated, isn't it? You know, it is and it isn't. I don't think there is a family in this country that isn't touched by mental illness or by substance abuse. And there are some fundamental things we know about how we treat our loved ones. And that is how fortune works. It's that idea that if it was your mother or your brother or your child in trouble, how would you want them treated? And we do know what it takes. We know that it takes holding people accountable. And it know, we know that it means you don't give up on them. 
And there are no mysteries to that. Uh, I think what fortune brings is a mix of people who come to the work through life experience and people who come through professional training and people who come through both. And that gives a lot of vision from different eyes and different perspectives. Uh, but I think this is a question of values as much as anything else. I think it's stunning that a country like ours puts so much resource into destroying the futures of so many people. And that's a choice. Joanna, you, you suggested just, just now when you called out mental health uh, issues and substance abuse issues, you're suggesting that there are uh, actual causal elements that include mental health, include substance abuse issues, self-medication, um, but there are causal elements that can actually be addressed that can actually be addressed in a healing way. I take it that, that, that uh, part and parcel of that are things like um, economic distress. Um, I take it uh, trauma, different types of trauma that, mm -hmm. that occur that engender certain uh, behaviors. Um, there are uh, probably other, other issues. Um, but what you're, what you're talking about is really more of a diagnosis approach uh, uh, as to the why, and then a treatment plan approach, which can include incarceration, but can include other activities, other supportive services that could start that process of healing. Now, you can look at this from a conservative or a liberal uh, perspective, but, but really what, what you're looking at more is how do you deal with the person? Is, 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 am I getting this uh, it, that's what it all comes down to. I, I think there are some places where the right thing to do and the self-interested thing to do line up. And I think criminal justice is one of those things. What we do when we do mass incarceration is we, we do huge damage and we run up huge expenses. And those expenses are both financial and they are expenses in terms of lost opportunity. Some of the best and brightest people coming out of our poorer communities of color uh, end up wasting their best years beyond bars, behind bars, and we lose them. Uh, I've been running Fortune Society for 31 years. I've been in this work since I was a teenager. And what I know, for example, is that substance use is spread evenly across the population. But if you look at who gets locked up for substance abuse, it's overwhelmingly low-income people of color. That's a choice. I think it's a terribly dangerous choice that we've made. So let me, just, let, me, let me just reprise this. So you're saying that all of us, all of us in our families have a certain level of substance abuse, regardless as to where we come from, our economic standard, uh, our race, our geography, we all have a certain level of substance abuse. But then if you're a person of color, in terms of your interactions with the criminal justice system, it goes up. What you see, if you look at the statistics, is that every step in the criminal justice system, from the decision about whether to arrest or not, to the decision about whether or not to sentence to incarceration, skews so that more and more people of color are locked up. Uh, I grew up as a white suburban middle class kid on Long Island in New York. Nobody I know ever even got arrested and drug use was rife in my high school. And when I go to Fortune and I talk to our staff, um, the step from incarceration the step from living in a community that was both hit hard by crime and hit hard by incarceration was right into prison. If you take a look at outcomes for these two communities, right? So we've been running an experiment in which we are incarcerating certain people and not incarcerating other people given the same circumstance. We've been running a, an experiment, which community is healthier? Right. And it shows most sharply around substance abuse because that's spread evenly across the community. Right. So, so what you've got is you've got 
an actual action that society has taken that is making a community less healthy. It's not only creating higher levels of, of incarceration, which could be justified if it was making those communities healthier or more prosperous, but it's not. It's doing quite the opposite. So we're taking an action, we're taking an affirmative action that is causing harm. And what's really interesting for me is what New York State has done, because we led the way in mass incarceration with our Rockefeller drug laws, and we are leading the way in the country in bringing down incarceration and bringing down crime simultaneously. So is it possible to have a safer community by locking up fewer people? I think we're seeing the data that shows it. Um, and, you know, I am always face to face with the human damage that does this, that this does. Uh, it's a dollar issue, it's a community safety issue, but it's about throwing away human lives and human potential. And it's about vanishing the men from the family. It's a catastrophic impact on what happens to families. We have multiple services and one of them is housing. And we built housing and we took in both people who needed permanent supportive housing because they had severe disabilities and were formerly incarcerated and homeless. And we took in families that were low income. I looked at every file. The families that were low income except for immigrants' families, were headed by women, and the only males were little boys. And the people coming out of the prison system were almost all men. 15% were women. So we ended up with a gender mixed building because we were pulling the men who'd been pulled out of their families and locked up, and the women who had no men in their families and putting them together. Uh, that is a catastrophic thing to do to communities. It has multi-generational impact. We have a generation of fatherless boys in our poorest communities and fatherless girls, and that's devastating. In terms of, of what we're experiencing right now with COVID-19, you have uh, interactions with people within the prison systems, people who have just um, exited the prison systems, um, and people who are trying to integrate into society. Has the COVID situation affected those three uh, groups of individuals who you interact with significantly? It, it, it has affected our work profoundly and not at all, which is kind of interesting. We are delivering some services face-to-face -face in the way that we've always done, uh, most especially our housing services, because we're running housing, so we're there. We're also doing work in the community, doing intervention when people are in crisis getting them food, getting them phones, getting them help when they need it. But most of what we're doing has moved to remote and we're learning some things. Uh, I'm actually really proud of how we're managing this because we're doing some things better than we did when we worked face to face. I've always been troubled by the fact that we have an office and that people have to come to us and they need to come during certain hours and the hours that we're open are not late on a Friday night or on a Saturday night. They're not when people are at highest risk. And now we're there 24 seven. We're there in people's homes when we need to be. And we're not going to let go of that when we come back to our offices. We've learned some things that I think uh, are quite wonderful. We are doing training, hard skills training, and we're having 100% attendance and graduation. So I think we'll be more effective as a result of this, but we're also seeing huge losses. It also uh, is making the point that you can have greater impact at a lower cost simply by leveraging some, some fairly simple technologies. I and mean, one of the biggest issues is that we have a digital divide in this country, which needs to be addressed, but certainly the cost of doing a video conference like this is much lower than the cost of renting an office. What we've been doing is supplying phones. I think that the problems in our society are showing up in sharp relief during this pandemic. And the digital divide is one of them. We're bridging it by making sure people have communication devices. But it's showing up in how well children can be educated remotely. Uh, it's showing up in terms of whether people can talk to their loved ones. It's showing up in isolation that yields mental health issues and relapses to drug addiction. So it's huge.
it's also showing in bulimic homelessness. What I find so interesting is that we're adopting uh, approaches that were pioneered by uh, African countries, South American countries, where uh, stringing wires, putting in infrastructure was so expensive, it was cheaper to put up cell towers and then to disintermediate all those companies that were uh, creating that physical infrastructure and, and, um, and eliminating the need for computers and other expensive equipment uh, just by moving to the, these, uh, these cell phones. And you're taking the same type of an approach with your populations. We're improvising and we're learning some things that will stand us in good stead. What do people tell you is the biggest need that they have when they exit incarceration? The first day they come out and they're trying, they're getting over the, the, the uh, joyous shock of now having to um, being able to move in any direction that they wish without restrictions, but there's also an, acclim uh, an accl acclimatization that's required. There's, there's a little bit of agoraphobia. The, the structure is now lost all of a sudden from, from one day to the next. What, what do they tell you is their biggest challenge? You know, I think we're talking about a Maslow situation of hierarchy of needs. Half the people coming out of New York State prison are homeless and they're being put into the large, dangerous New York City shelters. So that fundamental question of where can I lay my head and be physically safe? Tonight. Tonight, today, is the most compelling and the most immediate for about half the people that come out of state prison. Uh, the food, clothing, and shelter issues are primary. When we started doing work as AIDS was destroying our population, mostly being sick with AIDS was not people's biggest problem. It was where do I sleep? It was how do I eat? It was if I got arrested in the dead of summer and it's middle of winter and I'm released in t-shirt and shorts and flip-flops, how do I get a winter coat? So those fundamental issues are the first things that hit people in the face. The next set of issues are more subtle. How do I deal with loneliness? How do I readjust to a society that has changed fundamentally while I was away? How do I respond to the fact that I'm carrying a great deal of trauma and that I managed to suppress it while I was locked up because otherwise I wouldn't have survived? And that when I have a moment of peace, it comes rearing up. Those issues. How do I reunite with family? What do I do when my kids were five and they're 20 now, and they're 10, and I haven't been in the family. How do I respond to a family where everybody's active, everybody's drugging, and I've been clean, and I'm trying to stay that way, but I have nowhere to sleep. So there are all of those immediate survival issues. And then there are the longer term issues. Having been incarcerated, having had criminal justice contact, means having an albatross around your neck for the rest of your life. It means stigma in terms of issues like jobs, like housing. Uh, Fortune's an advocacy organization as well as a service organization. We've taken housing and job discrimination head on, and we're actually the plaintiffs in litigation trying to change that. How, how do we change our attitudes? Um, we are afraid of people who have engaged in conduct that has been damaging to society, whether it's been violent or nonviolent, we're afraid. And somebody comes out from, a, um, from an incarcerated state, they serve for quite a while, a few years, a few decades, and now they're encountering somebody like me who is afraid, who is afraid of, of hiring, who is afraid of renting to, who is afraid of, of the person that, that they are confronting, who might not have the same diction that I have or the same um, mannerisms that I have, and, I, and I'm afraid. How do I deal with that? It's an important question, and it is a very complicated one. A large part of the fear is about race. It's about fear of men of color. And that is true whether people pose a risk or do not. And the way in which you break through that is putting a human face on people. We have volunteers who come to us 
and they are not sure if they're going to be physically safe. And when they start working with the people who come through our doors, they see people who are human beings, and that makes all the difference. We go out of our way to send our staff and our clients to do public speaking engagements, because when you see another human being, the fear vanishes. There are times where one should be pose a risk. Right. But most of the people coming out of prison are not those people. Uh, the people we are most troubled by at Fortune are the people who've done decades in prison, who were a risk at 20 years old, and at 40 and 50 and 60 and 70 are less risk than anybody you'll meet on the street. And yet we keep them locked up. We've turned our prisons into old age homes with people who pose no risk at all. I think that if you don't look at the underlying issues of racism on this question, you miss the boat. What are your, what are your folks exiting the, the prison systems feel about things like the privatizing of prisons and the, the creation of prisons that are for-profit enterprises and how that affects uh, the whole dynamic? Or is this something that in New York State is less of a practice? It's less of a practice in New York State because the unions have kept out private prisons. But it is an issue in New York State where the prisons are for profit and they're holding immigrants. And for profit prisons are an ugly, ugly business. President Obama was going to end his federal contracting with them. When the profit motive means that you're driving your prison according to how you make the most income, you end up with you end up with security issues, you end up with lack of services, you end up with abusive treatment. Uh, I don't think we should privatize punishing people. I think we do far too much of it, but to make it a profit center, I think is appalling. And we see it in the immigration facilities and we see it in the private prisons. Do your people in, in uh, discussing what they've experienced, do your people give you intelligence beyond the conviction that, that it's an appalling business, that it actually, that, that these, these uh, facilities are run in a way that is more detrimental to the people who are being um, incarcerated and to society as a whole? You know, the data is all there. Uh, if you look at the studies that were done that were the reason President Obama was going to stop contracting with them, um, there have been numerous studies. If you look at the Marshall Report, what you see is horrendous conditions. And we've seen it on public television around how immigrants are held, how people are stacked up, how the services aren't there, how the COVID virus is split. They're falling places. They're an abomination. We should not be doing this. One of the biggest issues that, um, that our system has is its effect on young people. Because people who have been incarcerated have kids, they're members of families, they're uncles, they're, they're relatives. Um, and sometimes, as you say, 15% um, are mothers um, or, or are women. And, and you, know, you have, you have uh, mothers and aunts and so on. Uh, talk about how you help in, in these very complicated relationships so that younger generations are navigating lives um, with a, I mean, it's so, it's so difficult to say because we're using a big word, contextualized, being able to contextualize their own experience and, and manage their own trauma. So what we're dealing with, by and large, is multi-generational trauma. So we've been practicing mass incarceration long enough that you can have the parent and the child incarcerated in the same facility. Right. We've got generations of young people growing up with a parent or both parents incarcerated. We see them growing up in foster care. We see them growing up in juvenile institutions. Um, one of our founder did an interview with two of our staff who went through foster care and when they aged out, where did they go? They went to jail. So you're talking about multi-generational issues of trauma. We try to break through that in two different ways. One is that we have a really robust family services unit where we teach parenting. 
we teach people what it means to be a parent because by and large we parent the way we were parented and if there was no parent there where do you learn it uh, the other thing that we do is we work with we work with parents about how to be parents and we give them opportunities to practice uh, we also find that because of when people have child support payments due, they keep accruing while people are locked up. And what that means is that people can come out of incarceration with arrears that they can't manage, right. that keep them out of the workforce and keep them out of their families. So we work to negotiate those arrears so that people can pay them over time in a way that lets them buy the diapers and hold the job and be on the books. So, you know, we work to to fight some of those barriers. In terms of, the, of transforming society, talk a little bit about how you and your team, the people who have exited uh, prison and, and have become advocates, um, those who are still inside are helping to transform the system itself. So we've been a major player in working to close Rikers Island, for example, and in bail reform. And, and Rikers we, Island is the, is the well-known um, and often totally overcrowded with abysmal living conditions, a uh, jail in New Even York. Even worse, Rikers Island is the second largest, or was the second largest penal colony in the world. And the first largest was the LA County jail system. So that is an embarrassment and an abomination. We've been working to bring the population down. I'm actually proud of the fact that our Executive Vice President Stanley Richards was incarcerated at Rikers Island, and he's been a major player in helping to close it down. So yes, we advocate, we advocate for decency, we advocate for common sense, we advocate for saving taxpayers money, we advocate for making our cities and our, our states safer, and all of that yields lower incarceration. Are you finding that law enforcement are opposers or allies to these types of actions? It varies. We have many of our referrals come from police. We work closely with the police department, but we also are entrenched in a particular way of dealing with behaviors. And that is to lock up people in low income communities of color. And it does terrible damage all the way through. But you know, I am an incurable optimist. I see people change their lives, and that's what keeps me going. And part of it is, is really respecting the expertise of different players, your expertise, the expertise of the people that you serve and their lived experience and the value of that, the expertise of law enforcement and having these groups come together and chat. Joanne Page, thank you so much to ch for chatting with us, for sharing your experience with us. And thank you so much, thank your people and the people who you serve for their efforts to make this a stronger civil society. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for your focus on nonprofits because we're the first line of defense in a crisis. Oh, you certainly are. Thank you.